your name. Amen. Amen. I'm excited to preach the word. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been up here. We had a great message last week by Deacon Wally. And before that, our Thrive, uh, our Revive 21 weekend, November 19, 2021. I'm still flying high from it. It was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. You know, today we're going to look at a topic that I think is very vital to our walk as believers, and especially after having such an amazing weekend like we did on that 19th, 20th, and 21st uh, with great altar times and deliverance and people really experiencing legitimate measurable freedom and, and uh, we, that we could see with our eyes and, and hear with our ears on how people were, were delivered. It was, it was amazing. But Today we look at something that's incredibly important to each and every one of us in our spiritual walk as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. And it's this concept of a transformed mind. A transformed mind, spiritual maturity. Making that transition from someone who lived out in the world, doing what the world does, thinking like the world thinks, and becoming somebody whose mind is shaped and fashioned by the Word of God. You see, we, we learned a few things during that Revive 21 weekend about deliverance, and for many it was your first experience with that whole entire concept. We, we, the church of today in many cases has made it something that is, is almost secret or silent or not talked about, but yet in the scriptures, deliverance is, is a major aspect of Jesus' ministry. We learned in the, the deliverance uh, type of concept that we have to recognize that there's a spiritual realm beyond what we can see, beyond what we can hear, and that that existence has potential to have a negative impact on our life and living. It means that some of the challenges that you are, in, are facing are in fact not be, with the boss or the husband or the wife or the children, but are in fact because of demonic influence. What does the Bible say in Ephesians? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And in the New Living Translation, it says, but persons without bodies against principalities and powers of wickedness in heavenly places. You know, we learn that some of these demonic influences are passed down through the generations from one family to the next based on activities and sins and, and things that were done in the past. We learn that some of the demonic influence is an unfair attack of the enemy because after a person has experienced some sort of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, there is this imprint, there is this effect of the enemy that lasts a long time upon that person. We also learn that sometimes we encounter demonic influence because we've allowed our personal activities to get involved with things such as pornography, um, sexual perversion, or maybe witchcraft and things. So what we realize is that these, these entities, these principalities and powers come from many different places and for many reasons, some which might be our own uh, fault and some which might be the result of just passed down through the generations. And deliverance is the eviction, the casting out of the demonic influence from our life. It can happen at salvation. When you say, Jesus, be my Savior and Lord, people will say something left. An addiction left. I know people who have left the altar of salvation free from drugs and alcohol. It can happen at a prayer meeting. It can happen at a Revive 21 service. It can happen in a, in a phone call to the church where you say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. Would you meet with me? And we would say, absolutely. And it can happen then. We know that deliverance sometimes is dramatic and loud, and sometimes it has expression and manifestation, and sometimes it's completely silent and unaware, and you only know it happened because weeks later the person says, I no longer struggle with that. And they look back and they say, I was delivered that night. You see, deliverance happens to a from a response of genuine repentance. The Bible talks about godly sorrow. The difference between I'm sorry and godly sorrow is I'm sorry says I will try not to do it again, and godly sorrow says I will not do it again as long as I can tr with the very best that's in me. But you see, in the response to godly sorrow, the Bible says that soul ties and word curses and generational curses can be broken in response to godly sorrow and repentance and the renouncing of sin, sin that the devil can be cast out in Jesus' name. 
And there are many that would say that they had that experience on the weekend of Revive 21. Amen? And the purpose of deliverance is to remove the demonic influence in our life. And when the demonic influence is removed and its power is removed from our life, what what remains is a person, a child of God, a believer that has now been given the opportunity for freedom. You see, you... What was hindering you, what was oppressing you, what was holding you back is now removed. And I say opportunity for freedom because what it means is that each and every one of us have many choices to make. Every moment we wake up and put our feet on the ground, it begins a cycle of choices. Some deliverance is literally instantaneous. There's no residual effect. There's no... There's no uh, Former challenge is literally completely gone. Compulsions are gone. Temptation is either completely gone or it's it's so easily resisted that it's no longer a challenge. The mind isn't wandering to the pornography. Literally, you're not even thinking about it anymore. And if if the temptation came, you would would walk away from it easily because that's the the effects and that's the benefit of, of deliverance and the oppression is gone. Now, I'm going to take a take the risk of being transparent with you for a moment and share my own prayer time with Jake Kale and one of the team because I want you to hear how real deliverance is and can be in your life. You see, I've been studying deliverance for about a year and a half now, two years maybe, when pandemic started, and I had all this time on my hands at home. I couldn't leave the house, and I'm watching videos and came across men that were preaching about deliverance, and what I had recognized after hearing and learning about this is that there were some things in my own life that I recognized might possibly have been the result of demonic influence, and one of those areas that I believe that God had set me free from during that prayer time with Jake, and it was Tyler that prayed with me, was a spirit of death. And you say, well, pastor, you should know better. What do you mean? How can that happen? Well, my dad died in 1989 at the age of 45 when I was 20 years old. And I was told by one of my relatives that shortly after his death that my dad and his brother had gone to a fortune teller, and the fortune teller had told them that the one would die young and the one would die old. Well, my dad died at 45 and my uncle at 85. And even though I, even from the moment of hearing that as a young 20-year-old kid who grew up in the church, this, this immediate, this fear of death and preoccupation with my own death or the death of somebody I love, fearing being alone, losing my wife, losing people that I love was something that was overwhelming and constant in my mind. And, and literally from the age of 20 to 45, 40, I was scared of my birthdays and 45, I was terrified of turning 45. And it sounds irrational, right? It sounds silly. Why would anybody think that way? It was, it was, the, it was a consuming thought in my mind. And then our son Caleb gets diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 13, just six years ago. And and I would say for the last six years of my life, I have been fearful and almost anticipating the worst phone call of my life to hear that my son has passed. He wears a continuing glucose monitor that measures his sugar levels all day long. And if I woke up five times a night, I was looking five times a night to see where his sugar was. If it was going down, I was staying up to make sure it was, it was okay. If it was too high, worried about it too high, my wife experiencing some of the same thing, but worried, anticipating something that I could not control. But yet when Jake and Tyler prayed for me, that was broken instantaneously. <laughs> And I had the ability now to believe truth that I know. What? The truth is that my son's steps are ordered by the Lord, right? Knowing that my son has a call upon his life and God has a plan for his life. Amen? Amen. That my God is a good God. That I can trust my God with my son. And some of you may have experienced an instantaneous 
freedom like that. And boy, we rejoice in those. But there's a very important next step that many, many people must take that was otherwise uh, unattainable. And it's called transformation of our mind, discipleship, spiritual maturity. You see, what happens for some is, is that Sunday was amazing and Monday wasn't too bad, but Tuesday morning you woke up up and 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 the the kids missed the school bus right and your husband got up grumpy and loud and was screaming and yelling at you and all of a sudden you're bombarded with life and you erupt with this anger that you thought left you two days ago and some people would say i guess it didn't work i guess i'm not set free And you see, there's a lie, a part of that, because if you have been set free, you you felt it leave, you saw it, you experienced this freedom, you left here knowing something happened. You see, what happened on Tuesday morning was not that you lost your deliverance, unless all of a sudden you went back onto the pornography sites, unless all of a sudden you left church on Sunday and went and got in bed with somebody that wasn't your spouse, unless you opened opened yourself up, you could say that wasn't a matter of losing my deliverance. What needed to happen was I now had the option and the responsibility to step into my responsibility of developing a transformed mind through Jesus Christ. You see, we're three-part beings, spirit, soul, and body. And I say spirit, soul, and body in that order because I believe we incorrectly apply a priority to the flesh, our emotions, what we feel, what we think. And too many times people are making decisions based upon what they observe, their feelings, their emotions. Some are making life rad- radical life changes based upon how they feel, but it's an incorrect position to be making decisions from because the greatest place of influence should be the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God with inside of us, our spirit, and then our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, which should be transformed as a new believer in Christ. The flesh is just, the flesh is just a temple. It's just a house. It's just the shell that we walk around in and we spend so much time perfecting it and and changing it and we listen to our flesh and we make decisions based upon our flesh without considering the very truths of the word of God and not our brain but our mind because our brain and our mind are two different things. The brain is a tool used by our mind, our soul that is in the very core of who we are. We hear of transformation stories. And most of the time, they're about some aspect of this flesh, this temple that's been transformed. And whether it's a weight loss transformation. Today, people are telling stories about gender transformation and reassignments. And it's, and it's the, the manipulation of the outside shell because of what is being thought about in the brain. What is perceived in the mind. And you see, the problem is, is that this this perceptions, these thoughts are being conformed and fashioned, not by the word of God, but are being conformed to the world that is around us. You see, we need to remove the decision-making power in our life from our feelings and our emotions. We need to stop making radical changes in our life because of our observations with our eyes, the thoughts that come to our head, and start tapping into the truths of the Word of God so that we're no longer conformed to the world, but we're literally transformed by the renewing that is in our mind. And that's what it says in Romans 12.1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is the the next verse, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed 
to the world, fashioned by the world, directed by the world, couched by the world, counseled by the world. Don't allow your your values and the solutions that you think of in your life to be fashioned by the world because they come from a place that's false and and filled, filled with lies. Don't be conformed. Don't allow your values to be conformed by the world. Just look at the concept of human life, the sanctity of life. Whether it's preborn or elderly, there is somehow a devaluing of life when something becomes inconvenient and you're no longer able to produce and you're not easy to take care of or cannot take care of yourself. So many are housed away in places to be taken care of by strangers, never to be visited by their own family because that life has ceased to become valued. Children which are a gift by God ordained in the womb, their their lives are easily discarded because of convenience and and just the, the literal decision to say that is not life. The the Dutch countries have said they've eradicated Down syndrome in their countries, and what they've literally done is simply just murdered every child suspected of Down syndrome. And it horrifies us here in this setting to hear that. But we all live in a world that promotes that thought each and every day. And we are desensitized to it because we drive by a Planned Parenthood without any thought in our mind of what is taking place on the inside of bodies being sold for parts and life being discarded. Future Christians and doctors and lawyers and teachers and and people that are ordained by God and we have become conformed by the world. We see that even marriage is being redefined by the world. And oftentimes the kids are born, the house has been purchased, and then maybe we just might get married. And that's not a, that's not a thought process that comes from the scriptures. That's a thought process that comes from, from the world. The abandonment of children in our society today and fathers who have no idea how many or where their children are and mothers who just hand off their children so easily to another to raise. Why? Because there's a worldly value that devalues humanity and the life that is there. And when faced with decisions, we have this opportunity as Christian believers to go to the world or or to go to our God. Blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. And we see this, we see this, this progressive deterioration of a person who should know better going to the ungodly for counsel regarding things of importance in their in their life and the worldly solution to a pregnancy where there are already four kids in the home. I can't, I can't feed them. I don't know how to take care of them. I don't want another one. Is to simply abort that child when in fact that's a gift from God. And if you trust in your God, your God is going to supply all your needs according to your riches and glory. The one that might be the one to take care of you in your old age. Think about that. The solution to stress and anxiety is happy hour and drug parties. The solution to injustice for many is anger and rage. And the scriptures are saying, born again, believer, child of God, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. And you see, it's more than being conformed to the patterns of this world. It's don't be conformed to the patterns of Satan, the enemy of God. 
Because you see, we can't separate the patterns of the world from the, from the person who is ruling this world. And 2 Corinthians 4, down in verse 4, says, who, referring, it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Talking about those who don't know Christ. They don't know the gospel. They haven't been introduced to Jesus. It says, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You see, the, the world, Satan, blinds the world from knowing the truth. Ephesians chapter 2 refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air, who now works in the sons of disobedience. So the counsel that we achieve out there in the world, if it's not founded in God, it's literally finding its root in the very enemy of God, our enemy, Satan. But you see, the text says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't do things the world does. Don't value things the way the world does. But says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That we, as we come to believers in Jesus Christ, we have to step out into a process of spiritual maturity and transformation that literally renews the very mind that is inside of us. And you see, there's a difference between the mind and the brain. They're not the same thing. We say, oh, my brain's just not working. My brain is, is confused. I'm not making right decisions. And we, we blame it on our brain, but it goes deeper than the brain. And Carolyn Leaf describes the difference in the function of the brain and the mind. She says the mind uses the brain. The mind is a, is a manifestation of the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, right? The mind uses the brain, and the brain responds to the mind. The mind also changes the brain. People choose their actions. Their brains do not force them to do anything. Yes, there would be no conscious experience without the brain, but experience cannot re be, um, be reduced to the brain's actions. Why am I even bringing this up? We blame so much on the flesh, on our emotions, and even our very brain inside of us. We just say it's our, it's, it goes deeper than that. It's deeper than manipulating our flesh, manipulating our patterns, changing our, our habits. It's deeper. It goes into the place of the mind, and we either conform it to the patterns of the world or we step into a place where we begin to transform and renew our mind. We see we have to stop focusing on the flesh and start transforming our mind. And transforming the mind starts with increased intimacy with God. There's no shortcut. There's no shortcut. The only way to transform our mind is to increase our intimacy and our relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth. And you see, we increase our intimacy with the God of heaven and earth through prayer and through the word of God. And you say, gee, pastor, I thought you were going to give me something deeper than that, something new. There is, that's the problem. There is nothing deeper and more incredible about the truth that when you spend time in prayer and the word of God, it has an ability to increase your intimacy with God. And in the process of it, process of it your mind is transformed and renewed. Amen. Renewed. People say, I just wish I could change the way I think. Increase your intimacy with your God. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the word 
of God. Pastor, I don't know how to pray. You see, it, does, it, it, it doesn't matter if you know how to pray, if you know what to say. You see, the, sometimes the greatest form of intimacy is to be s- sitting next to the one you love and you're just holding hands in silence. But there's an intimacy that flows between you that does not need to be spoken. It's not about words. It's not about, about what is said and how it's said. Your God just wants to spend time with you. And we do that when we find our quiet place, when we sit down in our chair and we just begin to pour our heart out to God and meditate on our God. Prayer is Prayer is speaking and prayer is listening and, and we talk to God and we cast our cares on him because he cares for us. That don't be anxious for anything but in everything with prayer and supplication make your requests known to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and guard your mind. There's a transforming that takes place in the quiet place, in the secret place with God and sometimes you just sit there in silence and you're thinking about God and he whispers in your ear and that's the Holy Ghost talking to you, telling you that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he's going to help you through the day. He knows what you have need of before you even ask. He knows you're getting ready to go to a job you don't really much like, but you can't quit because finding a job is hard and you got a lot of bills to pay and kids to take care of and people are depending on you. You see, but you spend time in prayer and he transforms your mind and he gives you a new perspective and he shifts the way you look at this job you really can't like, you don't really like too much and you can't get, wait to get out of it, but you're stuck there. You're stuck there and you feel stuck there. Then all of a sudden you're spending time with God and all of a sudden you're like, wow, God, thank you for this job that allows me to make more money than I ever thought I'd make in my life. Thank you, God, for this job that allows my kids to go to camp, allows my kids to go to college. Thank you, God for this job and you begin to have a new shift in your perspective because your mind is being renewed. Your mind is being shaped and conformed not to the world. Your mind is being transformed in the, in the renewing of your mind. Matthew 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room. When you've shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You see, what that's saying to us is in those quiet moments of prayer when you're sitting maybe in the kitchen with your coffee in the morning before anybody else gets up and you're just thinking and you're praying. What's happening in that is secret. It's between you and God. But you know what? You told God that you needed some strength from the day. Well, guess what? You're going to walk through your day and all of a sudden you realize, wow, I've got more strength today than I had the day before. I've got some victory today that I didn't have yesterday. I just closed that sale, and I've been fighting to get that sale closed for the last month. Glory to God, because what was asked in the secret place has been manifest openly in your everyday life. But you see, transformation begins to take place in the secret place through times of prayer. We have to pray. There's no shortcut around it. We have to pray, and you see, we have to pray, and we have to spend time in the Word of God. Listen, Ephesians 5 is talking about husbands and wives, and it says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. But the rest of the verse is talking about Jesus, and he says, just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for her, that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You see, Jesus went to the cross for our sanctification. But you see, it's the very word of God that cleanses us and renews us and and washes us clean. We are literally cleansed by the very word of God. Our mind is transformed. Our mind is healed. Our mind is set free from worldly thinking when we dive into the Word of God. You see, that intimacy with God, it produces godly character and the fruit of the Spirit. You see, you may say, gee, Pastor, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that prayer with Jake really worked. And I'll say, why? He said, well, well, I was doing pretty good. And then on Wednesday, this lady rear-ended me in the car 
and, and she was getting all up in my face like it was my fault. And I just, I, I, I just lost it, Pastor. I just lost it. Matter of fact, the police showed up, Pastor. And, and I, I, I just, I have never, I have never been that angry. And I would say, well, were, were, were you doing stuff you shouldn't have been doing? No, Pastor. I don't know where it came from. It just, it came out of nowhere. And I'd say, well, sister or brother, I don't believe that you've actually lost your deliverance. I believe you just need to start growing some fruit. You see, because after the deliverance is our responsibility to walk in spiritual ma maturity. We're no longer conformed by the world, which means we don't react like the world does. We react like God does. But you see, there's only one way to get love, joy, peace, and uh, long-suffering and goodness and kindness and self-control, and that's by growing some fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you see, that takes time. That takes intimacy with God. You see, and when we see these things come, come into our life. We've been set free. Not everything is the demons, you know. Not everything is the devil. And I think we've talked transparently enough about it to know that, yes, if the devil's there, we're going to cast him out in Jesus' name. But once he's gone, it's now our responsibility to grow some fruit of the Holy Spirit. Pastor, I'm full of anxiety. You need some peace. Pastor, I have such hatred in my heart for this person, for what they did. You need some love. Pastor, I'm just mean. I'm just, nope, I'm just mean. <laughs> I've never had anybody tell me that, but I, I can see it for myself. You need some fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You only get fruit through intimacy in time with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's produced. It's a result of spending time with him. And you see, we intimacy helps us develop the fruit of the Spirit, but it also gives us the awareness and to the ability to take our thought life captive. You see, we have to grow in our spiritual maturity to where we begin to take the thoughts that enter our head captive. We catch them before they land in our heart. You start to feel jealous because you're working harder than that other person on the job and somehow they got the promotion with the nice new corner office that looks over the park. And you're like, that person doesn't even know how to do the job, right? And there's this jealousy and there's this, hey, it's reality, right? That's life in this world. Now, how did they get that job? And you're angry and you're steaming over it. But you see, that is not going to produce any good thing in you. It will not help you. It will make you bitter angry, mean, nasty. It will actually cause you to do a poor job on your job. And where does that lead to? But you finding a, another job. But you see, we have to think, take our thoughts captive. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God through pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When fear comes your way, you take it captive before it lands on your heart. How do you do that? You, you know you need to know the word of God. And when you know the word of God, you say, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but power of love and a sound mind. Right? My God has the purest love for me. And pure love casts out all fear. You begin to recite the truth of the Word of God. You got to know the Word of God. You got to spend time with the Word of God. And intimacy with God, what it does is it reminds you what the Word of God says so you can cast that argument down. You see, when your peace is all upset, you've got to go find your peace. You have to take action. Don't expect it to slam right into you. You see, he keeps him in her perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Amen. Right? 
And when we have these thoughts come into our life during the day and troubles, you know what? It, yeah, it might be the devil rebuke him in Jesus' name and cast him out. But you know what? We have to begin to remind ourselves of the word of God. And when I'm downcast one day, when my day is going really unexpectedly bad and I don't know what I'm going to do and I have too many questions in my life, I begin to remember what the word of God says. And you see in Psalm 121, it says, don't look down at my problems. It says, don't look at my worries. It says, don't look to the people that don't like me. It says, what does it say? It says, I lift my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. His foot won't be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel shall not slumber and sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is my shade at right, my right hand. He will, the sun won't strike me by day. The moon's not even going to strike me by night. The Lord will preserve me and he will keep me no matter where I go. You see, we have to remember what the word of God says. We have to cast down those arguments by reciting the word of God. You see, when my, I remember we were leaving church one night, Cooper City, Florida, going home one night, got a call on my phone to say, Jason, I'm sorry, the company has closed. Do not come to work tomorrow. That was an upsetting night. I'd like to think that I handled it correctly, but I remember I did not because I was quite upset. But I've grown a little bit since then. I've learned a little bit since then. And you see, if that happened to me today, I'd remember that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in wanting, amen. That he makes me to lie down in the green pastures. That he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through a very unexpected valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. Hallelujah. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. And his cup literally will run over here. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, I was a little worried. I was a little worried that after that incredible, great Revive 21 weekend where people were set free from many, many things, and there was genuine, literal deliverance like I experienced and other people experienced, I was worried that a couple days later or maybe a couple days ago, people would say, Pastor, I don't know if it really worked because I'm kind of having some struggles in my mind. Well, I'm here to tell you that the deliverance didn't fail. You simply, you're now stepping into the responsibility of having Having to learn to transform your mind, conform not to the world, but be renewed in your mind to step into a place of responsibility and maturity in your faith with intimacy through God, through the word and prayer, casting down arguments, remembering the truths of the word of God. Would you stand with me today? The prayer is simple. If God was standing right next to you today and you had to, and you were saying, and you had to ask yourself, do I have sufficient intimacy with my God? Would you be able to look him in the eye as he looks over at you? Or would you say, Pastor, I, I know it. I need to increase my intimacy with God. I'm not in the word like I need to be. I don't spend time praying like I know I should spend. But you know what? I want today to be a new day. I want to develop some new patterns, some new habits. I'm going to, as a matter of fact, I'm going to get my prayer room ready. I'm going to get a table and a chair someplace in the house. Maybe it's in the basement. Maybe it's in a bathroom downstairs or a big, big walk-in closet. You know, I'm going to find a place where I can pray to increase my intimacy with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm telling you, it sounds so simple that for many it would say, you know what, that can't be the truth. That can't be the way it happens. I'm here to tell you today that that's the way it happens. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, and we're standing here today recognizing that we need to increase our intimacy with you, our quiet time in prayer, and our time reading the Word of God. Lord, I pray that each one here today, Father God, Lord, that we would learn to not be conformed to the world, that we'd be transformed in the renewing of our mind. I don't want to do things the world does. 
I want to do things the way you would do it, God. Lord, I don't want to be constantly battling emotions and making and letting those emotions make decisions for my life and allowing feelings to govern and pattern my life. Lord, I want to be from the Word of God. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name you would give each one strength to know the difference, that you would give each one the tenacity and the perseverance to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Christ. And I'm going to let him renew my mind. Maybe you want to lift up a hand to say, Lord, I need you to renew my mind. Lord, I need you to renew my mind. I've got some thinking that's not so good. I need you to renew my mind. I've got some patterns that aren't so good. I need you to renew my mind, Lord. Lord, let it be done today. Renew our mind, oh, Father God. I know you will be faithful to do it, Lord. In your name we pray. And the church said, amen, amen. Lord bless you today. We're so happy you came. We'd love to see you on a Tuesday night for prayer. Take care. Invite somebody to next week's Christmas production. God bless you.